with a couple minutes delay, happy to see so many of you for our last webinar this year. We've had, uh, I think, a very exciting year behind us with uh, many great webinars, with many great content, lots of good discussions. Um, we thought we we're going to loosen it up a bit uh, before the holidays and uh, focus today a bit on the myths and fairy tales we've seen in pricing and uh, revenue management and to uh, make sure that all of you go with a clear side into 2024. Before we dive in, maybe a couple of words on uh, your host today. So um, your presenter today will be Ingo Reinhardt, as uh, most of the times uh, he's founder and managing director at Binomics, um, built the virtual shopper method, uh, spent significant time in pricing before, and uh, is going to guide you through our content today. Myself, um, I've been with Binomics uh, for quite some time now, working on different and uh, with our customers at the moment leading the product development and uh, I'll be moderating through today. Uh, we'll make sure that all of your questions will be answered. So please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We'll take some time at the end uh, to cover those. Quickly um, on Assets Binomics, for those who don't know us yet, we're um, a SaaS provider and we help you make better revenue management, revenue growth decisions. And we do that by leveraging our own virtual shopper technology. It allows you to holistically optimize your portfolio decisions, be it products, decisions, be it PPA, pricing, promotions, trade terms, all of that within one model and with extremely high accuracy. If you're interested, um, reach out. We're, we're here. Feel free to connect us on LinkedIn. We're always happy to have a coffee chat with you and to see whether maybe also we can work together and, and help you out. Um, I think with that, uh, no further ado, again, the reminder, any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. And then I would hand over to you, Ingo, to guide through our last uh, <coughs> webinar for this year. Yeah, thanks, Anton, for, for the intro. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining um, this webinar. This, as, as Anton said, is supposed to be a little bit more fun than the other ones. It's the last one for us this year. Um, we have lots of good stuff coming up um, after the break, uh, starting mid-January. So really excited to close the, the year with something interesting um, and a bit more 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 joyful, I hope. Um, the, um, if you have any questions or disagree with the, uh, the way we see these things, the myth and um, fairy tales and pricing, please write in the chat, always open to discussion and really happy to do so. Uh, particularly if you disagree, just let us know and we're, we're happy to pick it up at the end of the webinar. So um, this is the topic for today, uh, myth and fairy tales. I think there are lots of myth and fairy tale stories in pricing. Um, when you do like a basic Google search um, in the pricing revenue growth management field, to find lots of myth and fairy tale stories coming from everyone. Um, and I think the, the basic theme in all of these is um, to highlight things that are important in pricing so that you need to watch out for, for value, um, elasticities, other things that are important. We want to take a little bit of a different approach here and um, really um, criticize or um, look at some of the, like the, the core ways um, many things are presented in the pricing field um, and like be a bit more critical about them and 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 really look at them in, in a critical way um, and use it for, for our discussion here. So what we mean by that, let's have an example before we approach it in a more structured way, is I think something that most of us have seen in one way or another um, in, in many cases probably multiple times and it's one of the like the the, the most fundamental graphs um, that are available to justify why it's important to look at pricing and essentially the story always goes <clears throat> that when you look at the core levers that drive the profitability of an organization you have essentially four things that are that are important price variable cost volume sales volumes and fixed cost and then if you look at it uh, it's typically that the price uh, is the most important one of these levers uh, and um, i think this goes back to a survey by mckinsey and company i think that the earliest one is somewhere in the 60s or 70s and pretty much every company that works in pricing has has pretty much used this graph 
but it's based on a very fundamental assumption. Uh, and the way these numbers are typically created is if you look at the at the formula here at the bottom, the profit formula. So very simply, profit is price minus variable costs times the volume. And then you take the whole thing minus the fixed cost. And then when you um, look at like the average of, for example, Fortune 500 companies, you put in their um, actual margins, the actual sales volumes, fixed costs um, that are available in, in, in public data. You, you get the numbers that are presented here that if you increase the price by 6%, if you decrease variable cost by, by sorry, if you increase price by one percent, you gain six percent in profit with these average numbers. If you decrease the variable cost by one percent, you increase your profit by three point eight percent. If you increase volume by one percent, you gain two percent, two point one percent in profit. If you increase fixed cost by a percent, you gain about one percent in profit. And the the crucial assumption underlying this. Um, this calculation is that you have a price elasticity of zero. That's typically not, not mentioned in, in these comparisons, but it only works with the price elasticity of zero. So the assumption really is if you increase the price in the formula down here um, by 1%, you do not lose any sales volumes. And as pretty much all of us who have worked in the field have probably witnessed with, with real data, is that when you increase the price, there's always some some volume loss. And um, the extreme benefit here of the pricing in this calculation really crucially depends on the assumption of a price elasticity of zero. If you have a different price elasticity, uh, in the typical price elasticity, price is still one of the major levers, but um, it's it's not as simple as as it's shown typically in these um, in these graphics here. And these are the type of myths that we do want to look at here today. <clears throat> Just to get started, <clears throat> what, what is a myth? I think myths myth are important. Um, these are typically ancient stories or sets of stories um, that really explain like the early history of a group of people or about natural events uh, and facts. And so in our case, the group of people are pricing professionals and the myths are like a set of stories or beliefs that most of us share um, and really that, and that's important, I think that really serve to simplify our understanding of what's important in the field. And the myth that we want to talk about or look at in, in some detail here are um, essentially these four. And if you disagree or if you, if you have other ones, please put them in the comments. We're very happy to discuss them at the end of this webinar. And in our experience, I think four really crucial myths that we, that we see is um, in pricing revenue management is that costs don't matter for pricing. That's something we, we hear quite a lot. Um, another myth I would say is pricing is all about value to the customer. Then uh, often an implicit myth or assumption um, is um, often when we see companies that we work with, they often have like, um, price elasticity tables for their products where they say okay these are our say 10 products and there's a price elasticity attached to each of these products and the sort of the the myth is that price elasticity of a product is just a simple number like minus two in this example here and another myth that we sort of also see quite a lot is um, that all identified behavioral effects are equally valid everywhere so that means for example you observe something like a price threshold in a in a certain type of study where you ask, would you be willing to buy this product for 90 cents, 99 cents, $1, $1 10 and so on. You observe a price threshold that this price threshold also holds true um, in, in real data when you have like a full shelf of products to choose from. And these are the examples that, that we want to look into in, in a bit of detail in the following minutes. <clears throat> so let's get started here with the first myth, costs do not matter in pricing. Um, as I said, I hear this quite a lot. If you just apply very simple math, um, and we do this here with the linear demand function that we see on the left side, where um, the sales volume depends on the price uh, in, in the way described by this formula. So the volume is A plus B minus uh, B times price, where B is typically negative number and then if you are in this world where you have this linear demand it's very easy to compute the profit optimum the profit profit optimal 
price. Uh, and in this case, the price is just half of the costs minus A. A is the, the maximum sales volume you get if you give away your products for free, divided by 2B, because B is typically ne negative. This term here becomes positive in the end. But what's important is that um, the optimal price depends on the costs. And crucially, for example, if you have costs of 100 um, euros, um, and um, let's say your optimal price is uh, 200 euros, so you have sort of price elasticity of minus two uh, in the in the profit optimum, and your price increases from 100 euros to 110, then it's optimal to pass on half of the absolute price increase if you have linear demand. So as determined here by this formula, so you're always at half of the cost. So that means in this case, um, it's obviously or directly observable that the profit optimal price crucially depends on the cost. And it's also something, of course, that, that many um, companies know with um, cost increases during the inflationary period that we just saw pre predominantly in the last year, um, that many of them also passed on the, these cost increases to their customers. And also just one footnote here, um, that you pass on half of the absolute price, the cost increase in your pricing is a characteristic of this linear demand function. For example, if you have an exponential demand function, that means you have constant price elasticity in that case, you will pass on the percentage change of your costs. So if your costs increase by 10%, they go, as in this case, from 100 to 110, you would increase your profit optimum price also by 10% going from 200 to 220 euros in this case. So first myth busted, I would say, um, in pricing um, costs are important. And I think many of us know it, but everyone really should, should know that. Let's look at the second myth, um, which is really also key of uh, what we call value-based pricing, where pricing crucially depends, of course, on the, the value a product has to, to customers. But it's always, not always, but often phrased in a very simplistic way. Um, and here's just one example definition of what um, how, how value pricing is often defined. It says value pricing is customer-focused pricing. I think nothing wrong with that. Meaning companies base their pricing on how much the customer believes a product is worth. Um, and the, the difficult thing here is that um, in reality, everyone, and this is also um, shown or, or um, highlighted by the by a demand function like that, uh, where you have price compared to volume, and as the price increases, the volume drops. That means that the product has a different value to, to pretty much everyone. And every time you increase the price by, let's say, one euro, you lose the same number of, of customers because now then the increased price is higher than the value to these customers. So that essentially, there is not this one customer that value pricing is talking about. So there's not value to the customer, but there's value to a different value to, to each customer. And that's really important. Um, and that also links value pricing in this case to the price elasticity pricing that we looked in the in the previous cost example is that, of course, every customer has a different price. Um, and that's really crucial. And the way these different these values to the customers differ is also um, often <clears throat> depicted in a, in a very simplistic way. In many cases, we see um, or people or professionals talk about pricing or, or customer segments is more like the, the right side in, of these two graphs here, where you say, okay, there are, let's say you have a product with two features, maybe a brand and a size. And then you say, okay, there are different types of, of customer segments here highlighted by these four large um, uh, circles where you say, okay, there are like the, the price sensitive customers, they value this feature, but they don't value that feature. And then there are like the, the customers who value all features together, but have maybe a higher willingness to pay. So typically you have, when you look at it, something like three or four, four in this example here, different customer profiles that are characterized by their, um, by their preference in this case here for features A and B. 
Um, this is how many talk really about customer segments. But when you look at actual data, for example, from a conjoint study or from, from, from panel data, from any kind of survey, real data looks much more like the data here on, on the left side, where um, you have you, have, you do have differences. Some some customers prefer features A and B. Some are um, prefer both of them um, less, or maybe someone prefers A but not B, and so on. But in reality, all the data that I've seen in, in my life so far really looks like the the one on the left side, where pretty much most are in, in the middle, and you have a distribution, something like the size distribution of people. All people have different sizes, but most of them are somewhere somewhere in the middle. So this is important. So there's typically this simplification, and that's why we call a myth. They, when you talk about customer segments or value to the customer, this massively simplifies reality. Um, and um, it's really often in many cases, and that's what we see in our work, uh, an oversimplification and reality looks much more like the graph here on the left side. And it's important to know that and then properly, properly deal with that. Another example <clears throat> in the same line of thinking is um, with value pricing often comes price differentiation. And of course, everyone is dreaming of something that's highlighted by these two graphs here. Um, if we have, again, our linear demand function, we have um, certain costs here, $50. Um, and in this case, the profit optimal price, again, margin 50% is $100. And um, we have sales of 1000 at the $100. And we have a profit of 1000 times 100 minus 50. So the profit, if we have just a single price, is $50,000 in this case. If we apply proper uh, like optimal price differentiation in this case, we would sell to this one person with the highest willingness to pay of $150. We would sell to this person at $150, the next one, let's say $149 and so on. And the last person who would still buy at a little bit above $50 would get a price just a little bit above $50. And if we add up all the profits we get from these people, we would make a total profit of $100,000, which is highlighted by this, not square as in the, in the, in the left graph, but a triangle uh, on the right side here. So where everyone is paying the maximum willingness to pay. So this is the maximum you can get out of the situation is $100,000 instead of the 50,000. And I think most of us would of course prefer that. But the difficulty comes from if you actually wanna reach the triangle here, you have to be very certain that who the person is with $150 willingness to pay and who the person is with $149 willingness to pay and so on. So because if you have someone and you think this is the one with 150, but it's actually only the one with $137, uh, dollar willingness to pay, that person will not buy the product if offered 150. Uh, and if you go through that and apply some statistics, you will see that you, if you apply price differentiation, you have to be very close to knowing who has what willingness to pay. So, and if you go through the simulation as we did, it turns out that somewhere around a correlation of 0.95 you, is what you need between the actual willingness of maximum willingness to pay of your shoppers versus um, what you think their willingness to pay is. So you, you can only miss very few of the people um, in, in predicting how much they're specifically willingness to pay. And otherwise, going to all of them with the same price um, produces a higher profit in this case. So while theoretically, and you probably have seen this quite a lot, that um, price differentiation leads you from the 50,000 to the 100,000, but to actually get there, you have to be very, very sure that you know everyone's willingness to pay. Um, I don't always know my exact willingness to pay. So I can't say if today it's 150 or 137, maybe tomorrow it's a bit different. So. Um, what I'm saying is if you actually want to go for the full price differentiation here, this is very, very difficult and very, very risky. So in, in many cases, I'm not saying in general that it's not a good idea to, to apply price differentiation, but it's often a very, very risky strategy to apply different prices for these different people here. All right. And this all has to do 
typically with value pricing, uh, and this is why we're talking about this example here. The next myth we have, and it's probably the one um, that we're seeing the, the most in our daily work is the one on price elasticity. And the myth really is um, price elasticity is, is just the number. Uh, and I've seen, Anton probably as well, lots of tables where customers have shows like an Excel table and say, okay, yeah, these are my products, ABC, and these are the price elasticities that we see for these different products. This is really what we expect. And the problem with that is if, again, here in this case, we have this linear demand function. Um, and if you compute the price elasticity at the different points of this demand, is that you will see that it gets close to zero as the price goes to zero. And it go, gets all the way to minus infinity as you reach the maximum price at which still someone is willing to pay the product. And somewhere in the middle, of course, minus one. So what we're saying is, <clears throat> um, if a product has a linear demand function, it takes all that all price elasticity values between zero and minus infinity. So it's really difficult to say that's the price elasticity of this product uh, because it takes all price elasticities between zero and minus infinity. And this is not just a theoretical problem. This is, I would say, a real practical problem. So let's say you have a product in this case with a price elasticity at the current price of minus two, you increase the price by 10%, not uncommon or unusual um, in the last year, I would say with high inflation. Um, and then you go from a price elasticity of minus two to minus 2.7, which has very different implications and is very differently perceived as a price elasticity of minus two. So it's really a massive oversimplification to say, this product has a price elasticity of minus two, minus 1.5 or so, um, because it really doesn't capture the full um, the price demand relationship of that product. And I'm not even going into other uh, complications like what's the difference between just changing the price of this one product versus changing the price of my whole portfolio, for example, which also has implications for um, the price elasticity of that product. So it's really important. Um, and that's also something we do in our daily life with our solution uh, that Anton mentioned in the beginning is uh, really be able to understand the, the sales volume implications of all kinds of price changes that are in reality much more compl complex than just um, can be captured by this simple number, the price elasticity. So we really encourage everyone not to use this these too much. They're okay for a, like a basic, simple um, understanding of the dynamics, but for actual price decisions when, when more is at stake, it's always better to really have a more differentiated view and have an understanding of the full demand function, not just the price elasticity at some point. All right, the last one <clears throat> we want to mention today uh, here is um, on, um, on behavioral pricing and here with using the example of, um, of the price threshold. And typically most people, and this is also supported by, by lots of surveys, when they think about price, uh, price thresholds, th these can be very strong. So here in this case, we have a, I guess, chocolate snack and first, the, the the white line here is what came from from a survey, from a price survey, where people were actually essentially asked, "Would you buy this chocolate bar at sixty cent, at seventy cent, eighty cent, and so on?" And the white line here is other responses from from these people. And you see that there's quite a strong threshold between the one euro and the ninety cent, where you lose about thirty five percent in sales, which is something. Um, and I've done quite a few of them in my life, which is something that I see across the board when you run service like this, that you have quite a strong drop um, at the, for example, mostly at the one euro, one pound, one dollar mark. But what you then with the same product see in, in actual data in each one of these orange points here uh, is the price and sales volume combination of a week at which um, this product was sold is that the if you go through this cloud of, of, of dots here, there's of course as you expect 
the downward trend, the higher the price, the less you sell. But you don't see this strong price threshold here. Um, if you do the math properly, you see that there is a threshold, but it's much, much weaker than what is suggested by the survey. And this comes from the, from the fact that what's been asked in the survey is very different from what actually happens in reality. In the survey, people were only asked about what they think about this one product. So they were asked, would you buy this chocolate bar at this price or would you essentially buy nothing at all? Whereas in reality, you have the choice between this chocolate bar and maybe a dozen, two or three dozen other products. And the, the choice is quite different. It's not do I buy this or nothing at all, but rather do I buy this or something else? Um, and this means that the, the importance of the threshold is massively decreased. And this is something we see in, in real data. If you have a large shelf with dozens of alternatives, price thresholds of individual products are very weak. If you have a situation where there's just a single product, price thresholds are very strong. Um, or if you have just a few products, three or four, um, it's, it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and this is really important that you um, don't take the myths too seriously. Price thresholds, they exist. Yes, they do exist, but they're in reality not as strong as is suggested by a study that just looks at a single at a single product. And this is really important to know so that it always has to be context specific, uh, the way you apply this behavioral effect or all the other behavioral effects. They always in reality, they always depend on the on the circumstances, on the way the study is designed and the way reality is presented in these buying situations. And these things need to be considered um, when interpreting or, or using such results. So just to summarize, <clears throat> um, I think that there is a role for, of course, myth and, and anecdotes that really simplify reality. Um, but as we move to a world in where technology is playing an increasingly larger role, um, it's also important to really understand the, the role these misplay, they simplify, but um, and give help us understand the situation, but to really make good decisions, um, it's much easier to also work with proper technology um, and, and move forward. Um, I think particularly in the last year, I've heard quite a lot about AI and other technologies um, that will play a role. I think that's the, the right decision and the right direction, and it's certainly something that will help us move from understanding the the pricing world through, through myth and, and tales to really being using technology properly to make better decisions. That's, I think, the, the, the path to go. But here again, we need to be careful because it seems to me that there are also some, some myth forming around um, what technologies can do. And I think uh, time is too short to go into much more details on that. So. Um, suggest we we cover this in a in a follow-up webinar uh, where we talk about myth in in AI, particularly generative AI. I've seen many things that are promising. We did uh, before we did the party last night, we had the, a hackathon internally where we looked at different cap different options or different paths that can be followed using generative AI particularly, but there are also many paths that um, are I think less promising in the end than than it, than it seems at the moment. And like one thing that I always see is um, that, um, and this is one of the examples here in the right lower corner, synthetic data. So that um, many suggest that something like ChatGPT can be used to to produce synthetic data, so you don't ask and use it to replace the survey, so you don't ask real people about their willingness to pay. For the chocolate bar, for example, that we looked at, but you ask ChatGPT a thousand times what's your willingness to pay for the chocolate bar, and I'm not very optimistic about the 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 potential of using this technology in that way because it's not clear where ChatGPT knows from reading all kinds of literature what people would be willing to pay for a chocolate bar. Anton, yeah, thank you. Very nice. Um, looking at the time, we, have, we had a couple of questions around the price thresholds. Um, I think they were uh, very well answered already. There's a couple more. Um, we don't want to spare uh, or take too much time, so we'll come back to you on, on those uh, offline. Um, we want to use one more minute uh, given an outlook. I think uh, we'll have many 
interesting uh, webinars, many interesting talks uh, coming up next year. Uh, we had one in, with uh, Colin McKay from uh, Nestle a couple of weeks ago. There's many more talks with uh, yeah, peers from uh, the industry plant. And uh, we're very much looking forward to seeing you there. Um, it was a great year. Thank you so much for uh, joining a lot of the webinars. It was always a pleasure with you. And uh, again, if you have uh, any questions, if you'd like to get in touch, uh, please reach out. We're always happy to uh, grab a coffee or virtual coffee and, uh, and chat how we can maybe help there. And uh, with that, I think uh, we can close saying uh, thank you very much. Have a great uh, time off. Enjoy the Christmas break. It's always a break of uh, yeah, scaling down a bit, coming uh, out with fresh energy. And we hope to see you all back in the new year. Thank you, Anton. Thank you, everyone. Uh, same from my side. Have a good weekend, a great break after, I don't know if you still need to work next week. Then happy um, Christmas break and a uh, good start into the new year. Hope to see you then afterwards. Goodbye.